I know, I know, I know. I promised you routing next. But as I had put that routing section together and I had kind of sprinkled this DNS and ARP and DHC information in, uh, the routing we're going to do, especially the very first static routing lab, it's pretty detailed, especially if you haven't seen static routing before. So what I've done is taken this information oh, about DNS, a little DNS, a little bit of ARP, a little bit of DHCP, given it its own section, and I wanted to give it to you before we got to routing. So let's talk about DNS for just a minute or two, because most of us, if not all of us, are pretty darn familiar with us. And the first thing you think of with DNS, though, what do you think about? You think about a website because what DNS does for it, it's gonna take a host name that we put into a web browser, which usually it's gonna be a website URL, it could be an internal host, but it's gonna take that URL and translate the URL into the IP address that's actually needed to make the communication between the host and the website happen. Because when we type in, oh, I don't know, the bryantvanish.com, man, am I glad this guy finally got a decent looking website, because I was seriously starting to wonder about this guy. But in all seriousness, the URL, the bryantadvantage.com, cisco.com, whatever.com you want to go to, that doesn't mean anything to a router or a server. You know, it just looks at that or a router and it's like, well, you know, I don't know how to get to the bryantadvantage.com, but I know how to get him to this IP address. So that's what DNS is all about. And it's just that simple. A DNS query goes out asking for a translation of a given host name or a URL to an IP address. DNS server answers the query and we're off to the races. And it's so f seamless and usually so flawless that this is one of those protocols that we really don't give a second thought to because it works so well. ARP and DHCP are the same way, but for our exams, we need to know a little bit about details of each, and that's what this section is all about. And you also use DNS to resolve internal host names as well. And if we have a host that needs the IP address of a device it knows only as host B, then it's gonna to have to send a query out to a DNS server. And then the server can respond and say, okay, the address you actually want is 192.168.12, and that's it. So the question there though is, how did the host learn about the location of the DNS server to begin with? Now we could have it hard coded on that host. I hope not, because that means we're probably hard coding everything else on there. We're gonna talk about that, but more than likely, our host in this case received its IP address via DHCP. And DHCP would also tell the host where to find the DNS server. And at the host level, you can see that information on a PC with IP config all. And actually, I'll show you this live. I don't know if it'll have the IP version 6 address or not, but just one of our PCs here that I pulled up. And you can see among all this other information, here's the DNS server that I'm going to hit. So that's really it. And if I had a version 6 one, it would show up here. But I don't in this one. So it's just DNS server 192.168.1.1. And that's it. But I got that information from DHCP when I got my IP address and everything else I need to operate on this particular subnet. Now knowing host B's IP address is half the battle. And we need host B's MAC address as well, because while we tend to concentrate on that layer three address, and that's what we're gonna concentrate on for the remainder of the course, really, we've gotta have a destination layer two address as well. And that's where the address resolution protocol, ARP, comes in. Now, ARP does not have the equivalent of a DNS server. You're not gonna have a box on your network that's called, oh, this is our ARP server doesn't work that way. The ARP process uses a series of broadcasts and replies along with a cache of addresses. And you might hear that and think, hmm, broadcasts, I thought we were trying to get rid of those. We try to keep them to a minimum. We're never going to get rid of them totally. But the ARP process with that cache does cut down on the number of overall broadcasts. And to see the ARP cache on a PC, just use ARP and then uh, minus A or dash A, however you want to say it. And here's a sample, and this is the one we're going to do a walkthrough with. And you see a couple of entries there. There's the IP address. There's the physical address, which is another name for a MAC address, which is another name for a burned-in address, and type dynamic. So these were all learned addresses. We did not put these ARP entries in statically. So we're sitting there with that, though, but we look at this, and what we don't see is an entry for a MAC address of all Bs, which we're assuming host B has. So it'll send an ARP request, host A will, to the all Fs layer two broadcast address. And when I say all Fs, by golly, I mean all Fs, 12 of them. And remember, this is a layer two broadcast. 
and that request contains the IP address of host B and is requesting that the host with that address answer the request. And if we have four hosts connected to a switch, here's how it's going to go. Layer 2 destination comes into that switch, it gets forwarded out every port except the one it came in on. So those ARP requests are all going to go out and everybody's going to look at them. So C and D are going to look at them and say, well, okay, you know, I'm not 192.168.12, so I don't care, and it's just discarded. Host B, though, over there is going to say, hey, wait a minute, you know, I'm 192.168.12, I'm going to send an ARP reply, and the ARP reply goes straight back to the original requestor. And host A gets the forwarded ARP reply from the switch, host C and D are out of the picture by that point, and at that point, host A now has the IP address of host B and the MAC address of host B and can start sending data. And it's just going to make an entry just like the one we see here at the bottom, 192.168.12, all B's address. And the natural question at this point is, how long will this stay in the cache? Because as long as this entry stays in the cache, host A doesn't have to send a broadcast out again. If it wants to send something to 192.168.12, it knows exactly how to do it. But um, for your education and mine, I tried to get the definitive answer on this from some of my Microsoft friends, and as you'd expect, <clears throat> there is no one answer. I've heard everything from 5 to 20 minutes. Depends on which operating system you're using, which version of the operating system you're using, and apparently what phase the moon is in. And, but it's okay. We'll make fun of Microsoft a little bit. They can afford it. But that's not something that's going to come up on your exam. If you find a definitive answer, you know, tweet me at CCIE12933. I'd love to hear it. But it does cache for at least a couple of minutes, and that does cut down on the overall number of broadcasts. I do want to show you, too, that you can see the ARP cache on a router. Let me bring one up that's got a couple of fast Ethernet interfaces. Here we are. And you can see right there, show IP ARP. I've already run it. And these are the actual IP addresses on this particular router, 10211 and 10111. And they're on a couple of fast Ethernet ports. Let me slide that over a little bit. You can see 01 and 00. See the hardware address, etc. They're not going to age out because they are local interfaces. And that's how you see the ARP cache of a router, just show IP ARP. Coming up next, why is DHCP the network admin's best friend? We'll talk about that and see DHCP in operation with a walkthrough. Very important material for your exam, and it is coming up next.